Okay, welcome everyone again, and thanks for joining us uh, at this SOAS Linguistics webinar. Our presenter today is Rickard Dockham, who is uh, currently a visiting assistant professor at Swarthmore, also a relatively recent recipient of a PhD from Yale, where he worked on uh, the project that we'll hear about today, Quantitative Historical Linguistics and Phonology. Um, on primarily the Thai languages, but I think also some other languages of Southeast Asia. Rick is also a longtime resident of Bangkok, which I think explains some of the connection to these languages and his personal experience in that area. So we're really great to uh, be able to have you here today to get to hear about your research and the sort of wealth of experience and ideas and techniques that you put into this work and get to hear a piece of all of it. So thanks for joining us and we look forward to your presentation. Thanks very much. That's a nice introduction. Yes, no, I spent basically a decade living in uh, in Bangkok, so it's uh, it has certainly informed a lot of my work. Okay, are you able to see the slides I've put up now? Yes, looks good. Good. Okay, great. <clears throat> so the title of the talk today is the East Asian Voicing Shift: Desegmental Phonology and Tonal Reconstruction in Southeast Asia. So um, this is really part of a much larger project not to you know, toot my horn, it's just that there's so many bits and pieces of it that it, it can't all fit into one talk. So I've tried to carve out one interesting bit. So the, uh, the quantitative, this won't be so much on the quantitative side, but you, there is work on that that uh, I presented elsewhere, which if folks are interested in, in, in that side of things. But um, yeah, so today we're gonna focus on this one, uh, one angle. And I should also say greetings from Pennsylvania, although I, I, I have, spent much time in Southeast Asia. I have been back in the US uh, for several years now. And um, I'm at, at Swarthmore, Swarthmore. There are like four or five local pronunciations. Swarthmore, Sw Swarthmore, yeah. Anyway, um, I'm here at Swarthmore and we are actually part of a tri-college linguistics department. So it's these, uh, there are many small colleges. These are were actually all established by Quakers in the 19th century. And so um, even though they're not formally affiliated with the, the Quakers anymore, that is the who started them. And uh, so my office is right next to a, a Quaker preschool um, on campus there. But um, we have these, because we're relatively small schools, we have built a department across three campuses. So these are our, our lovely little schools here. So hello from here. The one on the left is also the one behind me. <laughs> That's the, my local campus. Okay, so our roadmap for today um, we're going to talk about lexical tone, Southeast Asia as a convergence area, and then some things about how tone arises. And then sort of the meat of the of things is the East Asian voicing shift and how that has played out in the Thai languages. Um, and then I'll also talk about some of the evidence from epigraphy for that. Um, so just a quick note about pronunciation. Um, you may know that the word Thai spelled with an H as in Thailand, which is the national language of that country. Um, when you see it written without an H here, um, whether I pronounce it as Thai or Thai, it's actually an unaspirated T, but I may, I sometimes I'm not very conscientious about which one I'm saying. Typically, um, when I'm uh, whenever I'm referring to this, uh, it's the, the branch or the family that Thai belongs to, um, as opposed to Thai with an H is the specific language in that family. So that's one small point of clarification to make. Okay. Um, I would also, of course, like to thank people who I've worked with uh, on this project. So um, Ryan German is a PhD student of James Kirby's at the University of Edinburgh, and I have the dissertation defense draft. I know it's almost it's he's at the very end of that progress of that process, and uh, looking forward to, to to seeing the work that he continues to do. But he's worked. I've worked with Ryan on developing some of these ideas with, uh, related to the East Asian voicing shift. We had a paper at the LSA. Um, in, in January of this year, um, if anyone wants to look at that poster for a little more detail. Um, and then also the National Science Foundation, uh, Swarthmore College, and the International Center at Yale have all funded different parts of this work also. Okay, so what is tone? Well, let's just see one sec. Okay, so there are, tone is used to, to mean different things. Um, in this case, we're talking about the use of primarily pitch to encode meaning. And so we can talk about the difference between lexical tone and grammatical tone, where lexical tone typically distinguishes the core meaning of words, right? So phonemic tone. Um, and then that is a different thing from grammatical tone, which also 
uh, you know, it changes the meaning of things, but is, is typically uh, seen as a part of inflection. So it's a, a morphological um, thing. And so I'll be talking about lexical tone in this talk. Now let's take a, a peek at the walls map. Um, there's actually a lot of tone around the world. Um, it depend, depending on how you count, this is an, a, a figure that uh, Larry Hyman likes to cite, that basically half or more than half of the world's languages make use of tone in some way. Um, now we don't need to argue about the exact percentages, but you can see here from this map where the white dots represent no tone and the pink and red dots are simple versus complex tone. I don't love the sim simple versus complex dichotomy so much, but basically that just means two tones versus more than two tones uh, under the walls classification. It's a nice snapshot to see that there are really these three big areas. So you have Africa, um, East and Southeast Asia, and then the Americas where a lot of tonal languages pop up. And of course, I want to share with you a fun tie tone good twister. Um, so this is not actually a tongue twister for speakers of the language because it's it's just part of the, the regular phonology. But uh, this would be uh, my, 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 my. So sort of a question and an answer. So this part is the question, which means is the new wood burning? My, 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 my. Uh, and then the answer is my, 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 my. No, the new wood is not burning. Um, and so you can see I snuck a little vowel length in there to allow me some extra words. But uh, but this is um, other than the the long vowels and the short the long versus short ah. This is four out of the five tie tones are in this one sentence, which is pretty fun. So it's a somewhat famous sentence um, that just is used to snimey language learners, I suppose. <laughs> now there's also a little bit about I could say about typology of tone languages more generally. Um, to go a little bit beyond the simple versus complex, which Walls adopts. We could talk about level tone, sometimes also called register tone, um, where it's generally conceived as being uh, multiple tiers, multiple pitches of, of level tones. Those could be combined in different ways. Um, we also sometimes talk about contour tones, where you have mid movement of the pitch uh, across the word, um, but you, that also combines with level tones in many languages. And then we also get a, a more com complex combination of things, where we have things like breathiness, creakiness, um, so what we could put under the single category of phonation sometimes. Uh, so contour tones combine with pho phonation um, to create even more fun. And so um, we often see that one pattern is, is dominant in a particular re uh, region. So we'll talk a little bit more about how that plays out in Southeast Asia. But this is you know, a, a general typology that you'll, you'll see cited many places. Okay, so mainland Southeast Asia. And I put the South in parentheses because um, our, our sort of general geographic labels of East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia, like they actually don't line up super well with the linguistic typology. And so the area I'm talking about is sometimes called mainland Southeast Asia. Sometimes also we talk about greater Southeast Asia, which includes typologically convergent parts of, of uh, Northeast India, of Southern China, um, will include uh, maritime Southeast Asia, it really depends on what features you're talking about. Um, but we'll talk about some of the features that can define this as a, as a convergence area. Um, so if you prefer the term Sprachbund, that's also available, but uh, I'm <laughs> not so confident in my German pronunciation, so I'll stick to the, to the linguistic convergence area. Um, people have called it many things, whether it's a Sprachbund or a diffusion area. Um, it wouldn't really be linguistics if we weren't arguing about what term to use to call a thing. But uh, um, the idea is that, of course, there are some features that cross family boundaries, um, or they arose in multiple locations, multiple situations within a family. It's not due to a single family that, that spread the feature across multiple languages. Um, and so mainland Southeast Asia is really one of the classic convergence areas because it's, A, geographically huge. It has a huge percentage of the world's population in it. And um, it just has some really, really remarkable um, cross-linguistic convergence. Um, and so some of those things include the syllable shape, so monosyllables and also sesquisyllables. This is a term coined by Matisoff, which means a syllable and a half. So it basically means like a, a, a sort of I am where you have a minor syllable that's not stressed and then, but it's really like treated like one syllable um, in terms of the language. So you'll get a tone, a single tone on the, the stressed portion. Um, and so it's not big enough to be called two syllables, hence the sesquisyllable label. But between monosyllables and sesquisyllables, that covers a lot of the, um, the, the syllable structure in the region. 
Um, we'll also talk, we, uh, tone and register are sort of famous. We'll tell you a little bit more about what register is if that term is not familiar to you. Um, we also see a lot of isolating morphology and then syntax, I just picked one famous feature in the area is the prevalence of numeral classifiers. These are these obligatory counting terms that appear with numbers. So you don't, you know, we have a handful of these in English, like you might say three loaves of bread rather than three breads or five ears of corn rather than five corns. Um, but it's really just obligatory with essentially every noun um, in, in this area. So that's another sort of famous convergent feature. There are uh, five language families. Um, of course, there are more languages than just these five, but these are the five major ones. And uh, look at the majesty of this. This is a, 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 not a perfect map, but a really pretty map. Um, so it splits Sino-Tibetan into Chinese, Tibeto-Burman, and Karen. Um, but you can see here that it has uh, all of the five families um, represented on here. Um, Kradai is the language family that Thai belongs to, also known as Thai Kaikadai, if you've heard of that term. But we have Austroasiatic, Austronesian, and Molmian rounding out the five. And so if your geography is a little shaky, this is, uh, this is Southern China. <laughs> this is uh, Burma or Myanmar. This is Thailand. We have Cambodia down here, Vietnam, and then Laos kind of in the middle there. And this is part of Malaysia down here, okay? And so then this is also, this is actually India there, okay? So what is convergent? Well, this is um, one of the big puzzles of dealing with a, an area that is so huge and, um, and is so, has so much convergence across the, the family. What is inherited from common ancestors and what is um, just simply parallel evolution, okay? So the classic puzzle, whenever we see something that, that pop up in a language or in multiple languages, right? We have to decide. Um, what is the best explanation? Can we attribute it to shared innovation? Meaning it's, uh, there's a single recent ancestor, uh, it's part of one recent lineage um, that split off. And so we would want to group those together as part of a, a single language group or subgroup. Um, is it shared retention? So there's some more, more distant common ancestor that explains why we see it in geographically or typologically disparate languages. So they can have inherited it from some distant common ancestor. Or we can just have chance resemblance. So it could be something like universal linguistic features or um, something about the physiology of, of the human vocal tract and uh, the, the acoustics of speech. There are all these kind of other pressures that can be attributed, uh, that can be used to explain um, common al commonalities across languages. We can just call that chance resemblance, where chance is not truly chance, but it's, it's combining, I'm just using it as a cover term to mean um, a set of other things that are not due to um, shared innovation or shared retention. Okay, so let's jump back into tone then. So originally, early on, it was, it, we didn't know that much about that many languages in the world, to be honest. So um, the number of tonal languages that we had uh, data on was really quite few. Um, the earliest use of, um, I guess the earliest record of tone in Western linguistics is probably only a, a less than 200 years old. I, I, I don't want to say that no one was talking about it before, but we have like an 1820s grammar of Thai that talks about it. We have uh, sort of missionary notes and sort of uh, colonial records that make mention of it in, in the area. But I, we, know from, uh, we know from Chinese linguistics, of course, that they've been dealing with tone for much longer, but uh, those, yeah. The, the two worlds kind of co combine though, Chinese linguistics and Western linguistics in one figure, which is Li Feng Gui. Um, so Li Feng Gui um, lived 1902 to 1887. He was actually Edward Sapir's first graduate student, um, originally at University of Chicago. And then um, when Sapir moved to Yale, uh, Li went with him. And so in 1928, Li finished his dissertation on, uh, on Matol Matole. I'm not actually sure exactly how that language is pronounced. I think it's Matole. Um, but uh, this is a, an Athabascan language. And the interesting thing is Athabascan languages are tonal. And so there was, or very early on, abandoned not to, you know, fairly quickly, this idea that maybe there's a single tonal superstock and Athabascan languages could be connected to Sino-Tibetan. 
Um, so this is sort of how early into uh, American linguistics and Western linguistics um, this kind of work goes. But this is not held up, of course, even though the funny thing is we know Athabascan languages are tonal, but the, the tonality of the Sino-Tibetan stock is the, the one that actually ended up more questionable. Um, so we, we learned a lot more since then, which has clarified our understanding. So we know that tone is, A, much more common than we previously thought. So that would cast doubt on the idea that there would be a single origin for tone. We also understand the phonetic mechanisms of tonogenesis thanks to the work of folks like Odrakor um, and Lee and others in the mid 20th century. And then there's also the generally accepted consensus now that old Chinese was in fact not tonal. And we um, understand by combination of the tonogenesis uh, phonetics, um, exactly how that came about too. Okay. So it took us a little while to get here, right? There must have been multiple origin points for tone. And yet, even though we have sort of carved off everything else into, okay, other things are going on. We know about tone in the Americas, tone in, uh, in Africa. Um, but the question of tone in Asia remained. And so Lee, throughout his professional life, continued to argue um, for a single tonal Asian superstock, although this has now generally also been rejected. So essentially that Sino-Tibetan included the Thai languages, included the, um, uh, the Hmong Mien languages. So now looking a little bit about phonetics of, of tone in East and Southeast Asia, we have typically isolated. So I've mentioned these, these features before, so I'll just um, skip past them. Um, but I'll just mention this term, the Sinosphere, which is sometimes also used, introduced by Matisoff, to refer to beyond the geographical borders, this sort of typologically convergent area, specifically that has um, sort of the Sinitic type uh, typological features. Okay. Um, we also know a lot more about um, tone in this region. We know that this tonal versus atonal dichotomy, that's, that's really not, it's more com complex than that. So Brunel and Kirby did a nice aerial survey and showed that it's there's more going on than just tonal versus atonal. We have a lot of phonetics involved. We have many other uh, features, including um, the phonation that I already mentioned, things like vowel length, vowel quality, um, other things that contribute to um, how to what essentially what fu what functional load um, tone bears in a particular language. How important it is to sustaining phonemic contrast, and pitch only turns out to be part of the picture. So let's take a quick peek and look at how it arises. This is the this is the account that was worked out starting in the in the mid twentieth century. Um, but the basic process is we start from intrinsic effects on pitch, where voicing for one example this is voicing, where voicing will cause a dip at the start of a syllable in the pitch, and voicelessness can cause a bump up in the in the pitch at the start of a syllable. And so then when you return to your baseline, you now have sort of a, a, a bump up, bump up, down. And so over time, um, these can be become phonemic. So this is a, a, a famous study from Umber et al. in 1979. The point is you start with something that's phonemic that is intrinsic and phonetic, but you have these phonetic cues, it's actually a bundle of features. And what changes is the weighting of those cues over time. So as pitch becomes, uh, a redundant marker along with something like voicing, um, eventually the voicing can disappear or whatever the feature is and it leaves behind only pitch. So subsequent speakers reanalyze uh, pitch as being the primary cue and this is what we call tonogenesis. So, so originally, so let me just demonstrate this with three stages. You start with a nice voicing contrast in the first stage, ba and pa. In the second stage, you get redundant marking. So ba and pa, but also have a low pitch on the voice and a high pitch on the voice. So ba, pa. So there's two ways you can use to distinguish that contrast. And then over time, the voicing goes away, leaving only the pitch. So pa, pa. And now you have only pitch that's contrasting uh, meaning. So that's a, a, a simplified explanation there. And here's an example of other ways that we have we can point to tonogenesis arising. So for instance, in the in the Hmong Mien languages, Ratliff's work showing that historically CV syllables in the early stage, in the atonal stage, if it was plain CV, it ended up with a level tone in modern language. If it was CV with a glottal final, 
it became a rising tone, CV with a H final became a falling tone, and if it had a stop final, it was atonal, um, and so it kind of is its own thing. Although in some, uh, some languages, those eventually develop their own tones as well. Okay, and so from there, we get subsequent splits that conditioned additional um, tones and mergers, or splits and mergers, okay? So what this, what we know is that there is this connection between um, historical segmental contrast, whether it's the, the voicing on onsets or it's the particular consonant at the end of a syllable, um, these things have led to tone. And so um, I've tried to bring these together under one title. And so I introduced this term desegmental phonology, um, which is to say, it's a subset of supersegmental phonology because it's diachronically meaningful. So we're talking about supersegmental phonemic contrasts, things like pitch, uh, things like tone, uh, but not just tone. They became transphonologized. So this is a term meaning they moved the, phon the phonological contrast moved from the consonants onto um, the supersegments. And this is different from things like intonation, other uh, and stress, other areas which we might class under supersegmental phonology generally. But because there is this unified historical explanation um, for a, a whole set of things going on in in East and Southeast Asia, we want to have a term to refer specifically to these. So this is an inherently diachronic term. It just means from the segment, right? So phono phonology that comes from segments but is no longer segmental. And so we can really call this two sides of the same diachronic coin. And in this way, we can actually unify the tonogenesis, uh, like I've just talked about, and also something called registrogenesis. So let's um, talk about, I'll talk about more about what registrogenesis means in a sec, but essentially it just means the, the, the origin of phonemic uh, phonation, like breathy voice and creaky voice. And so this is where Ryan's work is uh, sort of picking up the ball and running with it. Uh, I'm really pleased to see um, how nicely this stuff is, is working out. So he's working on a typology of desegmentalization and using terms familiar to, with us to sort of classify languages and different tonal origins and register origins in predominantly Austroasiatic, but also uh, in the area generally to identify things like progressive, they segmental change, regressive, and nuclear, depending on whether the tone or the um, the tone or register came from the onset, the coda, or somewhere in the syllable nucleus. And so, just to get a little overview of what kinds of segmental cues have led to tone over the years, we have things like final consonants that I just mentioned for the Mo Mien languages. That's also perhaps most famously um, where tone arose in Middle Chinese, also Vietnamese. We have cues on the vowels, so the Thai languages actually make use of a vowel length contrast um, to distinguish certain tones. And then um, onsets, so this is the voicing example I gave. So this is, this is the focus. And in fact, this is the locus of change in the East Asian voicing shift, is these onsets. Okay, so let's now talk about that. So the East Asian voicing shift is this term that I have introduced to, to encompass things that have already been described in different families. Um, it's this massively cross-linguistic um, loss of voicing contrasts. Um, so it affected not all languages, but all, all language families in the region. Um, and what, what happened was the stops and fricatives, so the obstruents devoiced, and they merged with their voiceless counterparts. Now we see some variations on this. In some languages, actually, we saw only the fricatives devoiced and the stops stayed voiced. There's, there's some interesting variation there. But by and large, this is the pattern, the devoicing of obstruents merging with voiceless counterparts. And um, then we also see the sonorants that there are some languages that had a voiced voiceless sonorant contrast actually saw a merger in the other direction where the, de the vo devoiced sonorants uh, merged with their voiceless or their voiced counterparts. So you have a loss of voice and contrast, but in a different direction. And then finally, we can say that this is something that swept across the, the Sinosphere, to borrow Matisoff's term again, um, during the second millennium CE. So it's actually more recent than we might have, have thought. And to give you a, an example, um, so in this early stage, we have ka and ga with a nice, um, nice voicing contrast, right? And we have three prototones, which we don't know exactly what they sounded like, so we just call them A, B, and C. You have an intermediate stage where voicing has been lost, ka and ka, right? And so we now have a split 
into A tone, but high, B tone, but high. So we don't know, like I say, we're, we don't know exactly how the, the phonetics of the pitches um, played out at this stage, but then we can observe on the surface tones of modern languages that we get often six categories. And so it's hypothesized that this is a stage that most of these would have passed through, this six tone stage. And this is referring only to, um, to the um, open and sonorant final syllables. The, the stop final syllables were their own thing because some of them stayed atonal, as I already mentioned. So if the language was already tonal, the East Asian voicing shift had this doubling effect. We went from three tones, A, B, and C, to six tones. We now you know, have to label them with these A1, A2, B1, B2, C1, C2, that kind of thing. If the language was not yet tonal, if it uh, was, so this is like most of the Austroasiatic languages, this actually led to the, the origins of contrastive phonation. So this is register genesis. So it's really a single change, the loss of voicing across the region that had differential outcomes depending on what the input conditions were. So if the input was tone is already phonemic, you got a doubling of tones. If the input was no phonemic tone, you got the origin of contrastive phonation. And typically the equivalent would have been modal voice, breathy voice, creaky voice, instead of categories like tone one, tone two, tone three. Tone three. And then in some languages that continued to evolve becoming um, vowel quality differences. So breathy voice, creaky voice has gone away in most dialects of Khmer and has conditioned these vowel splits. So here's my bold claim. I'll take a drink of water before I <laughs> make it. So feel free to prove me wrong, but I think that, you know, this, we really underestimate the, the, the breadth of this change, right? So the East Asian voicing shift is perhaps the most sweeping example of sound change that we have yet described in linguistics. Certainly it puts, it, uh, you know, when we talk about the great vowel shift in English, it puts the greatness of the vowel shift into sharp perspective. When we're talking about one language, they, it's suddenly great. Here we're talking about, you know, the, the uh, essentially the, the linguistic ancestors of billions of people. And uh, yeah, anyway, it's a, it's a large, a large swath of the of the world and a really impressive sound change event. So um, we should appreciate this the scope of it. Now, on to the timing. Um, there's more going on than just aerial convergence. It's like I've already mentioned, it's more recent than we thought. But the question is, how do we know it's recent? How do we actually date when this happened? And so there are really several converging lines of evidence. There's the phonetic evidence, which is sort of what we know about how tonogenesis and registrogenesis happen. I've already gone over that in some detail. There's the comparative historical evidence where we can reconstruct what the segments were. That's another part of how tonogenesis was in fact uh, discovered was by this combination of phonetic and comparative evidence. Um, we also have another interesting line of evidence in the form of uh, textual evidence. And so we can, have some anchor points for dating from um, the epigraphy that we see in languages like Thai and Khmer. Uh, so these are stone inscriptions. And then also there's Chinese records and translation manuals. And so we actually can look at how words, <laughs> so when they're recording words in other languages, they're telling us something about um, the historical phonology at the time of borrowing. And so there's a number of really interesting studies that have started to pick apart evidence from historical documents. Um, so very, very quickly, I just wanna give you an example of how these things played out. So I'm gonna skip past some of these slides, which um, I will make available um, for folks to, to go through in more detail. But what I wanna show you is these prototones. Remember I mentioned A, B, and C. We don't know exactly what they sounded like, but we can reconstruct some minimal triplets. And we saw we could see actually more went on than just the, the the East Asian voicing shift. So originally we would have had a split from three into six, but we have subsequent further splits. So it's actually more complicated than this. And I'll, I'll avoid getting into that now, but I just want to say it didn't stop at the East Asian voicing shift. There were subsequent um, onset changes that conditioned additional things. Now it's not that there were ever 12 tones. It's that each language made use of different conditioning environments. And so some languages might have split some off based on these, some languages might have split off based on these. And so different things like the, whether it was glottalized or implosive, whether it was uh, unaspirated, whether it was aspirated um, versus just voice. So this would have been the, this is the East Asian voicing shift. 
all three of these rows versus the bot just the bottom row. And there's a lot of work that has shown that there are parallel processes for this across, really across the region. And so to give an example of how Thai looks, Thai has five modern tones. The, each color is a tone. So this is one tone, one surface tone. We have a surface tone that cuts across these sort of multiple historical categories. And you can really see this is why it's complicated. The modern tones don't actually line up super transparently with historical categories. But once you know something about the origins of the, of the system, you can pick it apart. You can tease, it, tease apart the differences. And so here are four examples from Bangkok Thai, from Thai of Chiang Mai in Northern Thailand, um, from an example from China and Vietnam. We can see that each language really carved up the tonal space differently. Different um, condition splits and mergers affected what the modern tones are. And the colors don't matter. All this, and the numbers are arbitrary. The point is just to say, this is a five tone system. This is a six tone, six tone and five tone. So really the numbers varied. But if you look even here, right, you have a split with the top two and the bottom two boxes versus one and three versus three and one. So quite different outcomes. But I want to also point you to an, another important piece of evidence. Part of the reason why we know there were three tones is because uh, the Thai language actually had the earliest use of phonemic tone marking that we are aware of. Um, so there's, we know of, we know of about tone in, uh, in Chinese going back many, many more centuries earlier than this. But as far as we know, Thai was the first language to, to actually mark tone phonemically in the, the script as used by, uh, it wasn't used by the whole population, but would have been used by the um, sort of literate class at the time in the, in the mid second millennium. And so if you look here, you can see this kind of plus cross looking thing. That's the easiest one to tell. So I've, I've circled some of them where you can see that on above some of those characters, there was a, a no marking versus a, a single vertical line for one for the first tone and then a, a sort of cross for the second tone. So unmarked versus two different tone marks that indicates three tones. Now, the this is you know a strong evidence that there was there were three tones at the time of the invention of the of Thai, the Thai writing system around the 13th century, although this is a mid 14th century document. So this is yet another piece of evidence that um, this this would have predated the East Asian voicing shift. So I'm, I'm going to wrap up by talking about a little bit more evidence from epigraphy because it's, I don't think it gets nearly enough attention. So epigraphy in Southeast Asia crosses all of the families also. Um, so here are some examples of, uh, let's see, do I have, okay, good. I, I think, I hope I have a slide for each of the families, but um, here is one for the, the Kradai languages. So this is the Mango Grove inscription of Sukhothai from the 14th century. Um, we can, so we have, basically these are different scripts. These are the names of scripts. So we have the Thai Noi script, the Fakkam script, and uh, Thai or Sukhothai script. We also have epigraphy from Tibeto-Burman languages. So Pew and Burmese starting in the 10th century and 11th century. And so here is the Myazidi inscription, which is sort of a Rosetta stone of, of Burma. It has uh, different languages on different faces of the same text. Um, and so you have the Pew face and the Burmese face, which were both Tibeto-Burman. We have Austronesian languages. So starting in the fifth century with Jam, but we also have these other scripts. Again, these are the names of scripts, not languages. Um, but they recorded, some of them also coincide with languages. Um, they were used in areas like the Philippines and Indonesia um, prior to, so this would have uh, predated the Islamicization of Malaysian in Indonesia, maritime Southeast Asia, and predated the colonialization and Christianization of the Philippines. Um, Austroasiatic languages are some of the oldest records also in the region, so Mon and Khmer starting from the sixth century. Okay, so here's one from, from geographic Thailand, but would have been uh, the Angkor or the, I guess this would have been pre-Angkor even uh, empire in Cambodia and Thailand. Um, and so the reason I bring this up is because we have evidence from modern spelling, which provides us with these interesting puzzles that actually end up shedding light on tone, believe it or not. So we have this question of, well, why do we get etymological doublets <clears throat> in Thai spelling? So these Sanskrit loan words, so Sanskrit is uh, an Indo-European language, of course, and we have words like Uttara meaning north, uh, we have words for father, 
words for things like music and foot. They're borrowed in Thai, but they have these voiced consonants. Why is this a puzzle? But I can also point out, not only do we have and we have do we have doublets, so we have two forms with quite different phonology. So we have udon with a voice and this vowel change, and then uttara, which much more closely matches this, right? So we have bitu, which is a particular uh, inflected form that got fossilized, and tantri borrowed as dontri, and uh, pada as ba. Kind of okay. But if Thai always had these voiceless P and T, why do we actually see these forms? Why would we not just see them borrowed with the sounds that they, the accurate sounds that they had? Um, and uh, perhaps unsurprisingly, this is evidence for multiple pathways of transmission of these loans into the language. And so what I've argued in the past is that the Sanskrit loan words that start with these voiced consonants um, actually came by a Khmer. And they actually provide a snapshot of Khmer phonology at the time. And so there's actually Thai, Thai and Khmer has its own mini Rosetta Stone. The Mangro Grove inscription of the 14th century has Thai language, Thai script, Khmer language, Khmer script, and Pali language in Khmer script. So the same text in three different languages. So it, we have, you know, very good evidence of th this provides like unarguable, like a single point and place in time, but we also have the entire body of, uh, of evidence from the inscriptions. Now, people have worked out quite detailed sound changes for Khmer. And if you're interested in this, I'll just uh, provide a link, a, 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 uh, a plug here for the, this is based on Philip Jenner's, the late Phil Jenner's um, life's work on old Khmer. So ceiling.net slash okay, this is a project I worked on prior to my um, to moving back to the US and starting grad school. Uh, but there's a lot, a lot there, really interesting stuff to pick through. Um, but the point I want to make is just that the epigraphic evidence here is abundant, but really still sorely underutilized by, by linguists. So to take a peek here, the, what I want to point out to you is that um, this is the era where the, the Kradai people, or specifically the Thais, moved into Southeast Asia. It was during the Angkorian period. Um, and because of the, the size and breadth of the, of the Angkor Empire at this time, early Thai polities like Suva Thai were essentially vassals or something similar to vassal states of the Khmer Empire. There's actually argument for like uh, um, strong or widespread multilingualism in Khmer, lots of Khmer loan words in uh, sort of acrolectal vocabulary in Thai. So plenty of evidence that this was the case. And so this was a period of intense contact. Now, after the fall of the, of the Khmer Empire and entering into the middle Khmer period, there was a sort of swap of aerial prominence. And so that, that's a different uh, dynamic which affects things, but this middle period is what we're talking about. So what's the big deal? Why do we care? Well, in this specific case, when Thai borrowed the words, Khmer must have already gone in Korean sound changes. And the reason why we know this is because P and T became implosive B and the. This was not reflected in the spelling, so we wouldn't necessarily be able to date it very precisely. But the fact that Thai borrowed them with certain spellings that we know from our work on tone change came from uh, historically glottalized or implosive sounds, I mean, these would have been actually very close phonetic matches. So when Thai was borrowing Sanskrit words from uh, the Khmers in the area, they were borrowing with a close phonetic match. They weren't borrowing it with the etymological match, right? So they would have just borrowed it with the P's and the T's, but they were borrowing with the B and D, which is how it was pronounced. And so then later, voicing ended up being re-innovated. So they, the modern words, the doublets have the modern voiced ones, but originally at the time of contact, they would have been implosive and voiceless. And this is just one point of evidence that tells us or the early Thai contact with Khmer must have predated the East Asian voicing shift in, in both those languages. So we have the evidence from phonemic tone marking, the evidence from comparative spelling differences across loan words in the languages. Um, and so this is just a really nice example of how we can use epigraphic text, you know, that tie things to specific dates and locales that really provide uh, nice uh, extra evidence um, for our reconstructions. Um, and so this also opens the door to even more evidence from things like archaeology. Once we know things about the particular phonology at a time and place, um, that's another interesting angle that, that needs more work. Okay, so the textual evidence augments our comparative and reconstructive evidence. Okay, so that's where I wanted to wrap up. 
since I've been talking at you for a long time. Um, and so I'll just close by saying, look, we've come a long way in a century. <laughs> we, we've gone from, well, maybe they're all one language family uh, just a century ago or a little more than a century ago. Um, tone is all one thing to becoming, okay, well, it's aerial, something aerial is going on, but we're working out a more nuanced view. Um, we understand a lot more about the underlying phonetics. We can look at this sort of the specific sound changes, how they propagated across the whole region, and we can make maximal use of multiple lines of evidence to do so. And yet, <laughs> and yet, despite all this, we're still in the early days. So there are many open questions. These are, this is an example of the ones that I look at, but this is just a teeny tiny slice of all the questions that we need to ask. So the ones that I've been thinking about recently are um, just in general, how did the East Asian voicing shift play out in the Thai languages? Um, we know that it must have postdated the Thai diaspora. So it could not have been a single sound change that happened in their common ancestor. It had to have happened multiple times in the same language family which is an interesting twist. And so then we have to ask things like, well, how many different independent devoicing events were there? And so that, that is a, mid, a middle stage where we need to do reconstruction back to um, these, not, not proto thai but more recent common ancestors and try to posit um, these substocks that each underwent their own in, uh, instance of the East Asian voicing shift. And then from there, we need to ask, well, how much of that generalizes to the family, to the region, and to the world? And so that's kind of um, where we're at. If you have ideas on things to do with this, I'm super happy to talk about it. Uh, here is a public data set that I've made available of 300 uh, Thai language, tone, tonal data on 300 Thai languages. Um, it includes their historical tone categories. And for all the ones that we know, the, also the, the modern phonetic values in uh, this particular notation. Um, and uh, yeah, come talk to me if you have ideas, but uh, thanks very much. Here are some references and I look forward to any questions you might have. That's great, thanks Rika. That's super informative and interesting. I learned a lot in that presentation. Uh, let me open it up for uh, questions from anybody or comments. You can either use the raise hand function or you can note in the chat that you wanna ask a question. You can write out your question in the chat or you can just unmute yourself and start talking. To give a minute to see if anyone has a question. Well, while we're waiting for people to formulate the questions, Rika, maybe I can ask you a bit about the thing you spoke about at the end of like how common was this change? That was kind of, I was wondering, I mean, so it's, it seems clear that this is not just say five random innovations in these families that happen to be located in the same area and retained. Um, but it's also clear that it's happening in this area at a much higher frequency you know, than anywhere else in the world, basically, except maybe a few pockets in Central Africa and some other places. But so is it basically you have to come up with some kind of contact explanation plus maybe the right kind of phonological context for this to happen in? Yeah, so that's a great question. So um, because of the difference of the, the typological differences in tone, right? So you have the, the sort of the level tone or the only two tone system, whether the simple versus complex, that whole thing, we don't quite know with as much um, it, it detail what happened in, uh, or, or it, it's either much simpler or much more complex. So in the with the two tone languages of Africa, often it's very simply just, okay, it's probably something like voicing conditioned a two tone system. There is still a two tone system, end of story. Um, and then other, other places where it interacts more with, um, uh, with morphology and things, it gets more complicated. So um, there, there are questions about, uh, you know, what, what is the origin, were there segmental origins of morphological tone? And if so, can we reconstruct what those morphemes would have been? But there, it's also, what you mentioned is true that it requires a certain um, phonological context. And contact seems to be one of the ways in which that happens. Um, this is something that I think Matisoff also called um, the, the tonal milieu. So you need, monosyllables in, in East and South Asia, you needed monosyllables, um, you needed um, this particular voicing thing. And so you, the fact that they all line up in time means that there was something going on aerially in the phonology already that set the stage for everything else, for all these language families to undergo parallel changes. Um, but the fact that we can date it to after the, you know, the dispersal of Thai languages, means that we're still stuck figuring out, well, if it's not five, how many changes was it? 
Okay. Let's go to a question from Stravia. Uh, yes, hello. Thank you for this uh, very interesting talk. Uh, I was actually, uh, uh, when you mentioned the epigraphic evidence about three tones, I was uh, thinking about the fact that uh, the the interpretation of the tone also depends on the class of the consonant, the high, low, and mid-class consonant. So I was just interested in knowing your thoughts about the interaction of that and tone marks and uh, your research. Yeah, that's a great point. Okay, so um, let me go back to this table to answer that. Um, let's see, somewhere, this one. So the way that the way that tones are analyzed in in modern high consonants are are given classes, and the reason for that is exactly because of the outcome of of the the the, the East Asian voicing shift. So the way it works is these consonants in modern Thai are high class. These two middle rows are mid class, and these rows are low class. And the reason is that the middle two rows pattern this together tonally. If you compare these two, you see that they are not different. In some languages, they are. But when the writing system was uh, invented, there it was all different consonants. So everything that is the reason why they had to come up with the notion of classes is because you have a ka in row one, and you have a ka in row four, and so they have to be different classes of consonants that carry a particular tone with them. But originally, they, this would have been ga. So I don't think I have. Did I? I don't think I included a slide that shows what the the proto sounds were. But this would have been ga, and this, or sorry, this would have been ka, and this would have been ga. And so the, the notion of classes is a more recent um, sort of pedagogical tool for teaching how to combine what we know about modern tones with what we know about historical tone categories. So what we call tone classes are actually just stand-ins for proto-onset categories that no longer exist, that's, that have merged. And, but at the time like this, every, the, oh, I, I'm going the wrong way. <laughs> when I show you something like this, um, at the time of invention, every consonant would have been a unique onset. And so that's the key observation. Thank you. Yeah, that's, that's interesting. English isn't the only orthography with all of these retentions from former pronunciations. And we're glad uh, to have them. <laughs> uh, can I ask you about this devoicing thing again? Because how how cyclical is this? Because it seems like you go you couldn't easily okay, go from voicing to tone, but then you get voicing back in. Because I think in a lot of the African languages yep. that have tone, there's still voice consonants and all sorts of other complex uh, segments there. So, and that, that relates to also the question of like the languages that went from three to six. What was the original three? Was that a voicing to tone cycle that then repeated as tone came back in and went out again? Yeah, this is a this is a question of uh, of much debate. So, what were the original three? What what did A, B, and C mean? So, there is this really striking commonality where we have A, B, and C plus stop final, like you know, sometimes called D. So, A, B, and C and D, right? A three plus one system. We have that in Sinitic languages. Kradai languages, Momian languages, and Vietnamese. So it's across the families and Chamic languages. So there's there's something going on there, um, but what it might have manifested differently in different languages. So um, it might have been contrastive phonation. It might have simply been as simple as this uh, column A or category A was originally modal voice. Column B was breathy voice. Column C was creaky voice. It could be that. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, uh, Graham Thurgood has argued that there's obligatorily a stage in tonogenesis of passing through this contrastive phonation. That's you know not accepted by everyone, but that's one of the things that's been suggested. Um, others have said maybe it really was an early proto tone system. It actually was pitch, and so we don't quite know if it was truly uh, pitch based or what. But as for the cyclicality. Um, I don't know if we've if it's gone truly cyclical anywhere. We've certainly seen to, uh, voicing contrast reinnovated in a bunch of languages, um, so that's something that happens. Um, there is evidence that the East Asian voice. So it's, when I say the East Asian voicing shift, it's simultaneously a historical thing that happened in a bunch of languages over time, but ha is also a type of sound change that has continued to happen. Um, so we've seen um, Austroasiatic languages, which are not historically tonal, undergo something like this in the in the last, you know, century or two, probably since extensive contact with 
tonal languages like Lao and Thai. Um, so we, I don't think we've observed a full like loss and regeneration of tone, uh, but there's something going on with, uh, with voicing. Um, it'd be interesting to observe as we move forward. Maybe there'll be some you know, missing link language that we'll discover. Um, let me just quickly go to two of the messages that came in in the chat for you. One asking if there's any evidence of recent uh, changes in the tone patterns in this language. So Payman asked, do you believe that political upheavals of the 60s, 70s, people migrating from communist China changed the way people pronounce things? Or is there any other recent evidence of tone changes that we could track a little better? Yeah, so this is part of why tone has been so tricky is because when I talk about A, B, and C, you know, these are historical categories, right? But the actual phonetics of how each of these, you know, uh, to go back to the one with the co colorful pictures. So, you know, each of these colors is a, is a single surface tone, right? But the phonetics of it, the categories are stable, but the phonetics are really not. And so when we compare these things, you might see, actually, I think I have it in another slide. Yeah, this one. So, you know, we have mid-level, low-level, falling, high-level, and rising and high, but we have level, high-rising, low-rising, level, and falling with glottal. So they're really quite different, despite the fact that they have this very recent innovation. So it's absolutely the case that all kinds of things are going on in recent decades with the, the surface-level tones. But what's been remarkable about this is that things still pattern together historically. And so the difficult, the phonetics are the hard part. I really admire the folks who are working on tone phonetic change. The phonological change, the category level change, that's uh, a bit easier. So I don't know the specifics about what would have been going on with, uh, with, with China, but it really is true that in areas where all the segmental phonology is the same, right? You have the same consonant and vowel inventories are very similar ones. Uh, the thing that often distinguishes dialects in these areas is the tones. So it's really that you'll have just strikingly similar um, if you're not looking at the tones, it looks like they have the same phonology, but it's really just the tone that is the thing that distinguishes them. So I wouldn't be surprised both that it's used as a marker of identity to say, well, we're different from these people, but also something that could quite easily be influenced by um, you know, political, political movements and just the spread of different groups into different areas. Yeah. We also have a comment from Marie Taut, our resident uh, Sleti expert on the, an example from the, I guess, the far Northwest area of this convergence. The language Ahom, Ahom, I'm not sure I pronounce that, is today extinct and so tonic construction hasn't been possible, but there's neighboring languages that may have been part of this convergence area. So she says the Indo-Aryan languages of the Brahma, Brahmaputra Valley, like Sileti and Chittagonian, are also total languages. And apparently the evidence for Sileti's tonal genesis is related to loss of aspiration or aspirated consonant. So I guess that's another possible contrast or segmental contrast that could be lost. Yeah, yeah, and so that was one of the later um, ones. It, it didn't, it didn't lead to the loss, um, but it led to a, a split. So, like specifically, the whether something was aspirated or not, um, the ones that had historically been aspirated stayed with what, this tone, but the ones that only became aspirated after the the voicing collapse uh, kept a different tone. So we we see sort of bits and pieces of this. A home is part of the same family. Um, and so I actually spent some time looking at Ahom and working with uh, folks like uh, Stephen Mori and uh, Papi Gogoi, who've, who've done some work on, a lot of work on Ahom. And I don't quite know exactly how it, com how it overlaps with the other Indo-Aryan languages um, of the area, but I it's, yeah, there's a lot, of, a lot to work out. Um, we can reconstruct the Ahom categories, but we don't know anything about the Ahom tone phonetics. Yeah. And uh, so you mentioned this tone of genesis, but uh, what about when does tone ever disappear or is this pretty much a one directional change or what happens when we see loss of tone? Uh, I'm aware, I, in my head, I am aware, I, <laughs> my understanding is that there are tones, languages that have lost tone, but I, because I don't focus on this, I'm not sure of specific yeah, examples. Otherwise we yeah, all can... end up with a tonal language at some point if it was purely one directional. Yeah, no, it's definitely not, but it, it, it might be more closely tied to language shift. So for instance, the Ahom people is, is another example of this where historically spoke a tonal language, but rather than Ahom becoming a tonal, what happened was it was more of a language shift um, to Assamese and other languages that retained a lot of Ahom vocabulary as loan words, but they, weren't, they didn't have tones with them at that point. So it's not so much that Ahom lost tone, but it's that the language, the whole community shifted languages 
And so that's, but I'm sure there are specific cases of, of tone actually disappearing over time as well. Well, Rick, I know you have more meetings to get to today. So maybe we can wrap up there. I just want to say thanks again for this presentation. It's interesting work uh, for sharing with us and uh, all those who are going to end up watching this video on YouTube as well. So thanks for putting this together for us today. Really interesting. Yes, thank you. It's been a pleasure. Okay, thank you, everybody.